everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast. Knowledge Portals Accelerating Action from Genetic Data presented by Noel Burt, Director Operations and Development, Knowledge Portals and Diabetes Research, Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. I am Kaylee Bach of Labberts, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labberts. Labberts is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, type your questions into the drop-down box, and click Send. Answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom side, or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Noelle Burke. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Again, as Kaylee said, my name is Noelle Burt. I'm from the Broad Institute and also Accelerating Medicine's Partnership for Types of Diabetes. And today I'll be talking to you about knowledge portals, um, accelerating action from genetic data with using type 2 diabetes as a model. But before I begin, I felt best to motivate, to motivate a discussion about a uh, knowledge portal for type 2 diabetes. I thought it would be best to talk about human genetics as a broadly valuable tool for biomedical research. We can do cellular and molecular approaches to studying the cell or biologi biological processes to help inform prediction, prevention, and treatment, but really our human genetic variation is a fundamental tool in understanding biology and treating disease. And I would say over the past 15 years, there's been a deluge of information in that space, starting with the, the Human Genome Project, moving to the HapMap 2000 genomes, and then into the era of genome-wide association studies, and then moreover, large-scale sequencing studies. And it's really been quite amazing to be part of this field myself for the past 15 years. But what's been challenging is that we're really seeing genetics as a science of data. And this is even outdated slide right now. Um, at the Broad Institute alone, we've been lucky to just recently have sequenced our 100,000th whole genome. And the number of exomes is growing exponentially, as you can see worldwide, and both at the Broad Institute, we've done over 250,000. But the challenge here is getting this data to people who can use it and make sense of it, particularly for complex diseases. And the status quo right now is that these data are all over the world in various institutions, various academic organizations, and various companies. And if you wanted to interact with this data, you'd have to go to many different places. And in many cases, the data aren't even accessible to you because you may not be an expert in statistical genetics, or you may not know be part of the consortiums or collaborations that allow these data to be available. So we envision a future in a world where someone could interact with this data, search it, query it, and actually even better analyze it. So how might we do that? We envision a case that you could actually bring these data together. And you can imagine that there would be one place all over the world, but you can imagine certain, certain trusted places where data could be brought together from various institutions, respecting the provenance and the location of those data, but harmonizing them together in an integrated way you seeing them, representing them, stored, storing them such that they're protected, but also allowing a user to interact with them. Because what's critical is making these data available to the world will definitely have an impact on human disease. And that's the most significant contribution that all these data can actually bring. So I'm gonna offer you one potential solution over the course of our talk today, which is a knowledge portal with a model and types of diabetes. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we're doing that first, and then I'll walk you through actually how might you actually use the tool. So first, why diabetes? Well, it is a quintessential complex trait, in my opinion. Um, it, it affects about 45, 4, 415 million people worldwide. It's pandemic. And it also has a very highly heritable component with a risk of 30 to 70 percent. And it is the leading cause of cardiovascular disease and kidney failure in the world. So it's an extremely powerful disease to study from this perspective. So type 2 diabetes has been really successful, I think, in human genetics. So um, as of 2017, 
there have been about 150 loci associated with type 2 diabetes. So GWAS, candid gene studies, sequencing studies have done well to identify loci, which is great. But the challenge is, what do all these loci do? What are the variants that these loci do? And actually, how might we figure out their function and even moreover, the treatment for type 2 diabetes? Because this is an extremely powerful tool to uncover it, but what do you do with these data once you have them? So. The next step is to take these GWAS signals and translate them into biological insights. Well, for that, you need many things come to bear. You need to fine map the region. You need to know all the coding changes at the region. You need to know the underlying genes. You need to know the chromatin states and activities. But all these data need to be integrated such that you could find the causal gene or variant at the locus. But to do that, you need many approaches and many data sets. And these need to be integrated, but they all have their own data providence, domain expertise, which not everyone in the world can be an expert in, but they all need to be mined and integrated in a way that someone could ask questions of the data. So we present, and hopefully can, are getting a little bit closer, specifically for diabetes and genetics, is a means to make this data available. You're not only just a statistical geneticist who's working in the field, who has some data that they've analyzed for type 2 diabetes, who wants to see it in the concert of all the other genetic data available in the world for type 2 diabetes also make it available to the basic researcher who has a hypothesis about a gene or a product, or a biologist who's been studying a gene in the lab in a mouse model for years, and they want to know if you perturb it in a human, what is the effect phenotypically? And finally, we want to make better treatments. We want to make a way for people who are in the pharmaceutical arena to make better treatments to say, of the list of targets that they might study, why might they go after this one over another one? And human genetics is one very valuable tool in that space. And finally, for clinicians who observe a sequence variant in their patient and want to know what the heck it does. So for this, I offer the Type 2 Diabetes Knowledge Portal. Now, this has been around for about three years now. Um, it's open access. All you need is a Google account. And today, I'm going to walk with you how we built it, what's underlying, and some of the tools within it with which you can use to search, query, and analyze human genetics data for type 2 diabetes. But in order to do this, you really need an organizational body to support you, <laughs> someone who really believes in this mission. And so we're very lucky to partner with the NIH and five pharmaceutical companies in a public-private partnership that is solely at its mission to advance the understanding of type 2 diabetes and its complications. And the cornerstone tool of this is a knowledge portal for type 2 diabetes. But also the goal is to generate more data for type 2 diabetes and its complications and enable these information to be readily available to the world to support drug discovery. It's a really unique collaborative model, I think, because it's not only just a bunch of people working together in an academic setting, we're also partnering with industry in a pre-competitive space, such that they're sharing the targets that they're interested in looking at with us, and they're making them available to each other, which is very cool. Moreover, there are grants in this funding opportunity to bring data to bear, not only aggregate data all over the world, but also generate new data relevant to types of diabetes. There's also sites funded to build tools and methods, make better tools and method to integrate and mine genetics data. And all this comes together with a data coordinating center, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit because that's really at the anchor of representing human genetics data to the world. How do you do this? How do you see that vision that I showed you at the beginning of bringing data from various sites together, analyze it, QC it, harmonize it, and then make it accessible via a portal. So for that, we'll talk about the course objectives that we've achieved with the Types of Diabetes Knowledge Portal and where we hope to be headed. So there are three things I'm going to go through today. One is about the ingest and the analysis of the data. How do you build a warehouse or a clearinghouse for these genetics data? Then how do you serve it up? How would you want to look at it? How would you want to interact with it? For this is the portal. And these, I'll walk you through the various workflows and tools that we have that you can search the data. And then finally, if you've done this successfully, um, you can scale this to other diseases, particularly related diseases, but moreover, all common diseases. And then also, you hope that once you've figured out how to integrate human genetics data, you want to layer other data types. Because what, you, what I was saying earlier, in order to actually make any inference about variants and what their function is, you have to layer in other data types and allow visual representation of all those data sites in concert. So first, let's talk a little bit about the ingest and analysis of data. So for that, this is really our data coordinating platform. We're very lucky to be at the Broad Institute where we are funded to do this, and we're very lucky to represent the community on this, this, this effort. There are four components, I would say, to a data coordinating platform. 
And the, all of these need to be wrapped together in a modular and flexible software system that can be ported elsewhere, that can be added to, and then can adapt and scale. So these four components I'm gonna talk a little bit about, but the first of them is engagement and collaboration. You can't do this for every disease unless you bring the community along with you. You have to have the expertise from that particular domain, that particular disease to gather requirements. What do they care about in that particular area? You have to collaborate such that there's trust and you have to engage with them to figure out how you might do this. Then you have to have a data ingest and warehouse platform. And for this, we did this manually the first couple of years. It was about a handshake with data providers who are trusting us with bringing their human genetics data to us. We would work with them on the templates for transfer, how you bring them in, and then analyze it. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Once you do that, you gotta automate it because you have to be able to expand to all diseases and all data types across the world. And you have to impl implement the best practices of the community. And finally, federation. Because you can't imagine that one day, one place in the entire world is going to have all the genetic data in the world. You have to federate and allow data sovereignty, data sets that can't leave certain places to remain in their domain. So first, engagement. I'm very lucky for the past mm, close to 18 years now, I've been involved in the type 2 diabetes genetics community. And I really would say that that community, we were lucky enough to do our proof of concept knowledge portal with this community because at the heart, they had trust in data sharing. So to really make success in the GWAS era, you had to be sharing your results. And people weren't just gonna send all their raw genotype files because you can't do that because they're ethical considerations, but they were willing to share the results. And at the beginning, it was just sharing of these results with these communities and these consortiums you see here in this slide to gain trust, to talk about the methods we run, the way we QC our data, the way we store it, the way we analyze it and what best practices. So this community was critical to us because it helped us form the foundation of how we ingest data, what we require of people, what incentives there are for him, them and the community to join this effort, and then bring the data to one site that is trusted to respect the data use restrictions of all the human genetics data we're taking in, the representation, the analysis, and the best tools. So for that, over the past couple of years, we've been building, building a, a manual, effectively, because it's been involving many people, system to bring in all the data, whether it be the human genetics, raw sequence, raw genotype data, and summary level statistics, if we cannot get the raw data, bring in all the traits. So you have all these deep reach phenotype traits, not just diabetes, but all the traits that go with it, all the metabolic and cardiovascular traits. Then all the ethical documentation that we store so we knew how we can and cannot use the data. Then you have to build a system to store it, to protect it, and make sure that it's never exposed to the world in a way that would be any, against the ethical documentation underlying. Then you have to run all the analysis on the data. And then finally, if you're able to do that, you can release and share it in the portal that I'll get to in a moment. So we've been able to do this manually for several years, but we've also thankfully been able to turn this into software such that we can ingest data from anybody in the world, um, work with them in, in partnership and collaboration, bring their data in and QC it analyze it for association to types of diabetes and related traits, and all those methods and tools are the best practices in the industry. And those data can be represented on a portal that I'll show you in a minute. If data can't be transferred, we're very lucky because we have a very fast track system for which data can come in association statistics and be immediately harmonized such that it's treated exactly as the raw data, but it's all represented in concert for you on the site. But you can imagine if you're just putting results out there, you're gonna to wanna to be taken seriously, right? So you need to balance that open access with transparency and validity of results. So for our automated pipeline that runs association analysis for us, we produce with it your full, basically your materials and methods, if you will, for a paper. You can drill down to all the tests we use, the statistics we use, we store in the data, the full list of the results in a PDF if you really choose, Manhattan plots, the way we pre prepare the phenotypes, and the QCs we run, the principal components. All that is available to you if you are interested. But if you really just want to look at the results, you want to do that through a portal, and I'll get to that in a minute. So finally, what about federation? So federation is a great expansion tool in the sense that all data cannot come to the Broad Institute. And we don't want all the data. We want to maintain the domain and the provenance of many data sets, specifically for data sets that, for example, can't leave Europe. We want to make sure that a user can interact with those data sets wherever they are. So they can log on to the portal, they can run an analysis, but they don't know necessarily where the data are coming from because it's federated. And federation, we're very lucky to collaborate with um, the EBI. 
um, in the UK who houses EGA. And we now have federation with them such that there are data sets that live in the UK that are treated the exact same way as we treat them at the DCC or here at the Broad. They're stored, QC'd, analyzed, and represented in the same way, such that when you're interacting with them on the knowledge portal, you don't know where they came with, came from, but the results are represented to you in, in a harmonious fashion, but the data are stored, protected at the sites. So that's a really cool advancement for us. We're very happy for that. So now that you've figured out, hopefully, how to ingest these data, federate it, and also automate the software platforms underneath, how do you want to interact with it? So for that, you need visualizations and tools and moreover workflows, ways to actually take you from a question you might have, hopefully to an answer. So not just results, tables, and files that you can download, but really about an integrated approach to take you through a question. And really for me, this is about knowledge and guidance rather than just results. So that's what we're working towards over the past couple of years to build it from just a set of results to some sort of inference. So I welcome you if you're interested to log on to the portal. This is the front page. You can follow along with me. I didn't do a live demo because those never work. So I figured I'd do screenshots, but I'm gonna take you through several vignettes um, of how you might work with the data that I just spoke about and how you might, what questions you might ask and what you can do. So here's the URL if you wanna log on. When you get there, this is what it looks like. So the many places you could jump off from, the top bar has you know, your home, your variant finder and several tools, but mostly up there is the policies and the data if you wanna le learn about how we built it. But that's not as important as showing you how it works. So first, you wanna know about some of the data that are in the site. Well. The data that I spoke about earlier comes from this human genetics, um, the type diabetes genetics community. Right now we represent over 30 data sets in about 62 traits. And you can see them here. It's an interactive data page such that you can click the different boxes at the top and you can know what data type. So it's GWAS, exome data, exome chip data, whole genome sequencing data, and then all the different phenotypic classes, we can interactively show you what data sets are available for, for that trait. This represents integrated representation of both results derived from de novo genetic analysis of individual level data, but also pre-computed statistics. So these are the data. How might you work with it? So if you go back out to the homepage, there are sort of three ways you want to interact with the type diabetes knowledge pool. One is explore a gene or a variant, which I'll show you in a moment. One is the variant finder, which is a custom analysis tool, which I won't go into today, but I'll touch upon a little bit. But the first is sort of, you're sort of a new user and you want to know, you know, what is the full genetic association results for my phenotype of interest? And so for this, you wanna go right to that Donham tab, hit go where it says type diabetes. And what it will bring you to is what's kind of classic in genomic space is the representation via a Manhattan plot of the chromosome, chromosome and all the p-values for the type diabetes in the largest data set we have in the knowledge portal by default. So this is the X-Tex T2D exome chip analysis, which was just recently published and brought to bear on the site the same day publication was made available. And so this gives you sort of like a very high level look at the association statistics across the chromosome for this particular data set. And you could choose whatever data set we have in the portal from that drop down menu and sort of get a sense of what all the data sets look like in a very high level from a genetics perspective based on p-value. That's sort of just like one flavor. What if you wanna know something a little bit more detailed? You have a variant that you particularly care about, that you've been studying for years, or you're a statistical geneticist and you have a small data set for which you've done an analysis and you have a variant that you have a nominally significant association and you wanna know what else is known about it. So for that, you can go to the top button right here and click, this is our default variant to give you an idea. And you can go what I would call this page, the at a glance page. So this gives you, for this particular variant, all the association statistics that are nominally significant right away. Each box is a data set and it's color coded by its significance. And the top one is the most significant p-value on the largest data set. And so this says for all the data sets in the portal, what are the most relevant for association to types of diabetes? So this gives you your sort of like at a glance, gives you the odds ratio, the direction of effect, the allele frequency, sort of pertinent information for you. But really what you wanna know is, what about other phenotypes? Do you just have diabetes? What else can I know? Well, you can also click right below that and see the association statistics across all the traits we have. So this will give you the direction of effects, the beta, the allele frequency in every single data set we have and all the phenotypes we have. So this is a bit of a deluge of information. It is sort of just a list of results. It's not quite enough for you. You probably want more interactive. 
However, this is extremely useful for a group of people who are doing replication or have small data sets for which they have results or want to do lookups of something that they think is very interesting. And you can see this in one, um, one use case where some of our colleagues use the knowledge portal as an in silico replication of a variant they had. And they actually published this along with their other findings in Nature Communications just recently. So this gives you an example of how you can use the knowledge portal to look up data you, that you know about from a variant of interest or just learn what we know about type 2 diabetes genetics in aggregate. But what I think is most valuable and what's different about the knowledge portal is that beyond just results sharing, it also integrates workflows. So in the next section, I'm going to walk you through an example, particularly from a, from a, a group that worked very closely with us and a project that I'll use as an example. But I'll take you through the knowledge portal and how you might walk through what I would call a workflow. And this workflow is around prioritization of variants for functional study. So for example, this was published in Nature Genetics. And, and on the gene I'm going to walk you through is CDC123. And this was um, a labor of love by many of my, my, my personal colleagues, actually, um, where they used genetic fine mapping and genomic annotation to find causal variants for type 2 diabetes at several known GWAS loci. So what do they need to do this? They needed many data sets. They needed the experts of mavens in those particular fields to help them integrate those data, layer them together, and derive results. And it took them many years, lots of data sets, and a lot of work. Well, what you're lucky is, we're lucky because these people now work with us and they brought their data to bear in the portal. And then you can now use the knowledge portal where these data sets are actually visually integrated for you that you can see some of these results. So let's walk through this model now. So you'll go back to the main page and you can type in your gene of interest, which is CDC123. Hit go. And it will take you to what we call our gene page. But our gene page for me is our first sort of workflow page. It's, the, it's designed to start you at the top and work you down into more distilled and sort of nitty gritty granularity depending on your interest level. But what you start with when you're here at the home page is what we call our traffic light. And our traffic light is an algorithm that helps to take all the genetic data that is in the knowledge portal for types of diabetes and all the other phenotypic traits and say right away, is there strong evidence for signal? So if you get a green, that means associated with a particular phenotype. So this tells you right away, is there something in this gene that's worth, worth you know, noting? And so for this, you see that type 2 diabetes and type 2 diabetes adjusted for BMI are significantly associated with type 2 diabetes, I mean, with this gene. And then there's other traits for which you see in yellow that are nominally associated. And then in it, you'll also see all the other traits for which we have data in the knowledge portal. And you can click on all of those and see the results. So that's sort of one view. And this is algorithm-based, such that it's taking all the data and integrating and giving you the best evidence. But what if you want to see how we derive that evidence for signal? So for that, you want to go to our common variance tab. Now, historically, if you wanted to do this, you'd have to go to various GWAS sites, the Diagram, Magic, which are these large scale consortia for types of IBs and related traits, pull down the data yourself, integrate it, have a lot of domain knowledge in that space and pull it all together. What you have here, it's all distilled for you. It pulls it all together and it rolls up for you the best p-value in the best data set for that common variant for type 2 diabetes. So that's right there for you and you can peruse down through and see all the variants. But what do you want if you want to know about high impact or coding variation at this particular locus? You can go to the next tab that if this gene, which doesn't have any coding variations in it, you would have you would see all the high impact variant results for type 2 diabetes. But what we do do is if there are low frequency variants from um, sequencing that are here in, um, in CDC123, you will also get the aggregate variant test results right there pre-computed for you. But that's just one view. You want to go deeper. You might want to say, hmm, I want to see what's around this site. So this is a, you know, a gold standard in the field. Locus Zoom gives you your region view. This is used in many papers that represent you know, any fine mapping for type 2 diabetes, I mean, common diseases, GWAS signals, that is. So you can go here. You can select your phenotype. You can select your data set. And then you can see the Manhattan, I mean, the Locus Zoom plot for all the variants at this site. So this, again, is a different view of all the association statistics for CDC123 in a particular window. And if you want to layer integrated data sets, the relevant tissue expression data, you can layer on underneath it so you can get sort of a region view of this locus, all the association statistics, and all the genes underlying it. But 
this doesn't give you all you need if you want to prioritize variants for functional study. You want to know what's the best variant. I might go on if I want to go perturb it, understand its function, and actually know what is actually going on at this particular locus. For that, you want to go to our credible sets tab. This brings you to the, and for a given region, the best variants that you would want to functionally follow up and study. Moreover, it actually then layers the tissue and the um, regulatory information on top of it such you can see which is the best variant for studying. What you'll see here is that the best variant from um, the association analysis is not the one with the best functional data set. So you'll see the one that's got the yellow and orange tracks is one that overlaps with adipose tissue, hep G2 tissues, and islets. So this, from the posterior probability, is the most likely variant that you want to follow up for function. And this recapitulates the same SNP that we found in the Galton and all paper. So this shows a way of layering the GWAS, the, all this, the genetic data, the fine mapping data, and the annotations, the tissue and expression data, in one visualization such that you can mine it and ask a question about it in that manner. However, that's all pre-computed. What if you want to go deeper? What if you want to do analyses that are hard to pre-compute because they're computationally heavy. What if you want to know how many independent so associations are there at a locus? Do conditional analysis. That requires interactive analysis. What if you want to run an aggregate gene level association for a custom set of variants that you are choosing on a set of samples that you want to choose? So this is where we get into sort of, I would call, our sort of hypothesis testing or generation space. So everything I told you about earlier was about seeing results represented from pre-computed association statistics, whether we did it on the raw sequence data and genotype data or from summary level statistics that we had aggregated and integrated. But these two tools I'm going to talk to you about are interactive in the sense that when you're asking that particular question on the site, it is calling data on the fly and interactively running that data on the raw sequence and genotype level under the hood, protected, and then bouncing to you back the results. So this is a very cool tool, in my opinion, because this allows you to ask questions of the data on the fly um, based on hypothesis. So for that, you can go to our main page, and I'm going to use TCF7L2, which is a gold standard in type diabetes genetics, as an example. It'll bring you to the, the gene page, as I showed you earlier, and showed you the top associations for both the phenotypes that are significant and nominally associated. But to do this, you want to go down here to the locus zoom tab again. So first, what if you want to do conditional analysis? What do you want to know? You want to know is what's the best signal at this particular locus and what other SNPs might be contributing to the site, the signal, excuse me. So for here, you want to pick one of the data sets for which we have individual level data. And here's an example. So this is in our dynamic module. You'll see static, which is based on summer level statistics. And if you select that, it will bring up for you this MEDSIM study, which is an example of um, 9,000 people we have a, a, in, with individual level data. And then you can select the top SNP, and you can run the conditional analysis on that particular variant. And this will use interactive analysis. So we'll use a tool called HALE, which has been developed at the Broad Institute, which uses is run in the cloud, and it runs dynamic association statistics for you and represents the results back to you on the fly. So if you do that, that's what you'll get produced. And you'll see by conditioning upon that SNP, what is the results that, that what are the other SNPs, are there other signals at the locus that are contributing to the signal? And again, you'll get the layering of the tissues and whatnot. So that's one interactive module. The next one, which I find is really exciting to me, actually, which is our gate tool. So this is to run, allow you to customize the variants you want to analyze and the phenotypic criteria you want to use. So for that, I'll give you another great example using SLC388. Again, you'll go to the gene page for that. You'll type it in, and you'll see that it is associated with type diabetes. But you want to know basically what SNPs that are you know, protein truncating, for example, are associated with type diabetes. So for that, you want to go down to the high impact variance tab. And you wanna to go to run a custom burden test. And for this, you'll come up with what our gate tool. And there's a guide there if you wanna look through it and it'll tell you, give you some inference about how you might make your selections. But first, you wanna pick your phenotype of interest. And we'll start with diabetes. You can also stratify by ancestry. You can, you can do your results stratified by ancestry and there are five within the knowledge portal. Then, you want to pick your variants. And this you can pick by the variant filters. Here I'm picking protein truncating and missense with a minor allele frequency of less than 
And for that, then you want to then load those variants and you can pick and choose which ones you want. If you only want a few of these, you can cl click and highlight which ones you want. Next step is you want to select a subset of samples based on phenotypic criteria. So for that, you'll see that we have 18,000 samples from whole exome sequencing available for you to query. So these are interactive analyses such you can run on the raw sequence data protected under the hood safely at the data coordinating center. So for this, you can select, for example, if you wanted to look at the different, these are different phenotypes for which you can select on and filter based on a criteria that you have. So what if you want to run by BMI, for example? You can type in a criteria that you would have and it will automatically show you what samples you would be drawing from at that particular time. Then you'd be launching the analysis. And for this, and then finally your step would you control for covariates. And we have your standard PCs you would control for and then you would launch the analysis. Launching an analysis runs an association analysis and burden test on the fly for you on the 19,000 exomes that are hitting, sitting behind the firewall and represents you the results on the fly. I found this to be one of the coolest modules sort of that differentiates from just results sharing, but allows you, if you are sort of a maven or very interested in association statistics, you can actually do some hypothesis testing or actually moreover some inference on the site um, with interactive um, raw sequence data, just only, but only representing results. So these are sort of some of the vignettes I want to take you through. And you may be wondering who's using the site. Um, you know, it's it's not Google, <laughs> it's not even close, but we're very lucky that we have about 7,000 users, which I think is pretty cool. Um, we're very excited with that. What's really cool is that we have about 100 interactive users a day across the world, but 66% of them are coming back, which I find really to be the most gratifying in the sense that it is useful to them in their research, which is perhaps the most important thing. And the average connection time is about eight minutes. And um, that means people are hopefully not just, you know, landing on the page and leaving, they're trying to do some things. And we'd like to extend that because we really want them to be using the site, giving us feedback and hopefully making it better. So in the final few minutes, I wanna take you through the last component of the knowledge portal, which is scaling to other diseases and other data types. And for this, we'll talk about two thing, places where we've scaled. Because once you've done this for types of diabetes, really what our users have been asking for is phenotypes related to types of diabetes. Because for types of diabetes, most people don't die of types of diabetes, they die of all the complications. So the micro, micro and macrovascular complications of types of diabetes are really what they care about knowing if they can protect and prevent. So for that, they want us to bring in data sets from cardiometabolic spaces and other related phenotypes. But to do that, you also need to engage with the larger communities. So we thought we'd start small there. And we're very blessed. So once you build this architecture, you build this architecture such that it's nimble enough to respond to other diseases. And the importance then is you need to engage with that community, understand their different needs, the things that are very important to them in their space, how they feel about data sharing, what they want to make sh shared, and what incentives are important to their community. So for that, we were lucky to partner with Jonathan Rosanne and the International Stroke Genetics Consortium because they are very interested in this model. And we were able to build them a portal for cerebrovascular disease, which just launched um, almost a year ago now. And this is built on the exact same software framework, same ingest mechanism, same analysis mechanism, but with the best practices from the stroke genetics community imbued on the analysis such that it's represented in the way that community needs their data represented. But the principles are the same. It's all association statistics, same tests, same sort of structure, and then also the same portal framework to represent the data. But what we've been very lucky with these people to work with this, these colleagues is they've been thinking about other ways that they want to advance the knowledge portal tool. So if you, if, just to give you a brief summary of what's here, there are about 80,000 samples and these are all, um, these all allow you to interact with the exact same ways that I showed you earlier, the same structure and the same function, but they've added a couple other vignettes to it. So their data sets, you can see them interactively the same way as you would for the types of diabetes knowledge portal, but they have about 19 data sets and 45 traits. But what they've done is they found it was really important for them in their community to make all these statistics downloadable. Um, because they wanted it to be, they wanted to go one step further and say, you know what, if it's published, you can have access to it. You can put a copy on your hard drive. So we've added that feature to, for their particular co community. 
That's only useful if you can do analyses downstream with the subject summary statistics, but you can use the portal if you're not an expert to interact with all these data that are sitting right here. Additionally, we also had a great collaboration with this, this group um, because they were interested not only in allowing people to see results, um, but also allowing people to do their own sort of analysis on individual level data, not necessarily protected. So for example, while we allow um, custom analysis and you only see results, some, people, some communities really are just trying to allow their other analysts within the community to have access to the data that they normally wouldn't. So create, um, for, for lack of a better term, a work, workflow or a sandbox for which they could protect in a protected space, interact with individual level data and ask their own questions of it. So add their own tools and own modules. So we're very lucky to partner with the AHA, uh, Precision Medicine Platform, to bring to bear some of those tools. Let me talk about that real quickly. So for here, if you go on the site to this particular data set, you can go to the data set, you'll find all the relevant publications for this data set. Um, but you also could click on that, um, the AHA logo there, and it will bring you to their PMP, which is a totally different URL. It's just, it brings you out of the knowledge portal framework to the AHA PMP site where you can log in and gain an account. But what they offer in that particular space is they offer access to individual level data, and you can create these workspaces where you can run notebooks based on Jupyter notebooks of analyses, store your results, and make ask questions of the data in a protected environment. So what's cool is the Knowledge Portal framework offers you access to the results. This offers you particular drill down to data sets that are available in this particular space. This is very useful for you know analysts who have a particular tool. They run and run on the data that they couldn't do normally. So they can ask for access to this particular data set and use this as um, a model for them. And you can see this is what it looks like. So that's kind of a neat. Um, co-development we were able to do working with great collaborators. So we're also lucky, oops, back up. Um, we're also lucky to partner with Sekar Kathrason and Patrick Eleanor, who are colleagues who actually have the office down the hall from me, um, to build a knowledge portal for cardiovascular disease. And this was just launched in November. And this site, again, the exact same underlying software architecture, same data types, but totally different phenotypes. Very lucky to be associated, very you know, interesting for type diabetes because all these phenotypes are remarkably interesting us from diabetes. But we're really lucky because they really wanted to get their data out to the world, timed with publication. They wanted to allow people to have the exact same questions that we allow with the types of diabetes knowledge portal to be made, to be made available for cardiovascular disease. So for this site, you will see um, 23,000 um, early onset MIs samples available um, from exome sequencing that are available for interactive analysis, 154 samples for atrial fib, um, 300,000 samples for lipids. It's really remarkable the amount of data sets that this group has brought to bear. And what's awesome about this group is they have their own team of analysts, statistical geneticists, and methods developers who are thinking about new ways to look and visualize the data, and we're working with them to integrate their tools as well. So again, same framework here. Again, I was mentioning many data sets, same, same sort of type of data sets, but again, for different phenotypes. And you can interact with those in the exact same way you can interact with them for type two diabetes. And so, and then um, one other thing, just to give you an example, so this data set we know was made available earlier this, this year for 3,000 samples with lipids. These are on the site for you to query. So one of the things we've been working with um, the cardiovascular group is every publication that they now have, we time it such that the results go live on the knowledge portal the same day as publication. So that you can see the results, you can see the paper, and then that same day you can go to the knowledge portal and you can see all the results and ask questions about them. And this has been, we found this to be a remarkably cool and valuable tool as you publish and as you allow people to interact with your data. But what about other additional expansion? So for that, we're also very lucky because we've been collaborating with many other groups, both locally here and, and at the Broad, and also internationally to develop beta sites because these people have you know, different communities where they may not want to make their data readily available to the world just yet, but they have tools that they want to get out. They have data they want to get out, and they're really trying to socialize this idea. So there's three portals for which we've developed beta sites. We're hoping to release over time, one's for inflammatory bowel disease, one's for epilepsy, and one's for sleep disorders. But all these have slightly different 
coolnesses to them. Um, one is they interact, they interact in, 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 the integration of epigenomics data and other data types is key to one of them. They also have different ways of representing results. The epilepsy has gene level tests that they want to represent right away. So we've been working them to develop interfaces for that. Sleep genetics, our colleagues there just want a way of getting their data out upon publication. And that's really important to them because they found that that's been very limiting to them as even in their collaborative space. We're also expanding to new disease communities, including Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, and lipid biology. So what's exciting about this is this is teaching us how to expand the software platform, but also integrate and collaborate with other people who have different ways to represent and visualize the data. So then finally, we talked about scaling to other diseases. One point before I end about other data types. So we've talked a lot about human genetics, and I think we've done a good job of bringing that, those results to bear in a way that you can interact with them in ways you probably couldn't three years ago even. But what about layering of other data types, particularly for this vignette I was mentioning earlier where you want to prioritize variants for functional study, or you want to know about other data sets that are relevant to types diabetes? How do you bring those together? Because there are many approaches, as I mentioned earlier. There are mouse models, regulatory variants, expression data. It goes on. What you want to be able to do is make sure that all the data being generated from those, those various approaches has the relative data provenance respected, because we're not going to be an experts in every data set, but also brings to bear the relevant information and knowledge represented in a visualization that gives you the right information that you might want based on your query. So this is going to be a long active process. But for us, what we're starting with is using the model of federation. And the reason federation is critical is because we can't reinvent the wheel for, for example, what ENCODE has done for years or what GTEx has done for years. We want to leverage their work and integrate it such that it represents the domain of that particular field, but integrates it in a way that answers the questions that people might want to ask for the particular disease or phenotype or variant that they're asking about it. So the place where we've made some inroads there is through, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a federation. And I call it integration by federation because it's the integration with epigenomics data. So our colleagues at the University of um, San Diego are working with us because they have all the raw epigenomics information data stored, QC'd, analyzed in the way that's best from that particular field. And now on the knowledge portal in the coming months, when you query those, those tissue layers that I was showing you, it won't just come from our repository here at the Data Coordinating Center. They will come from the Epigenomics Federation that is at UCSD, bounced to you and represented for to you, such that we can bring in individual level data sets we never normally could. We're going to have the domain expertise from that world, and it's all integrated for you on one site. And so we're hoping to be able to expand that to different approaches and data sets such that it will make it such that people don't feel like they have to bring all their data one place. They can actually federate with us, and it creates a way of enabling far more data sets to come to bear. So where are we headed? Um, as I mentioned earlier, we want to expand this platform to ingest more new data types and new analysis capabilities. We're really hoping to reach out to other disease communities and figure out what types of questions they want to ask. We want to bring sites together also in the same space. You can imagine for type diabetes, what's relevant to type diabetes is also relevant for, for heart attacks. So you can imagine these sites coming together at some point into a cardiometabolic site. And our collaborators are really keen to do that because they want to leverage all the data inside of both. Because many of the data sets in types of diabetes, those samples have trait data on heart attack or lipids. Same with data sets that might be relevant to cardiovascular disease, they're going to have types of diabetes status. So if you can make the com community comfortable with sharing in their own community, you can imagine a world where they're sharing across. And for that, you just have to have that very strong software platform underneath that is nimble enough to, to add in the different communities, but represent the data in an integrated fashion. So that's one way we're developing. We're also developing into new disease communities who have different ways of prioritization of variants, who have ways of uh, representing the data, who have different data sets to bring to bear, who have strong connections with biobanks, for example. Those are the places we're really hoping to expand. Moreover, we want to make the portal more useful. We want to create new and enhanced workflows and visualizations that incorporate different data types and layering, sort of like the 
uber UCSC browser, if you will, if we could ever get that, that good at what we do. And finally, we want to scale and incorporate to new disease communities such that it's open access for every disease that's interested in building this. So this is hopefully sort of the beginning for us, and we, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to answering questions, but I want to thank the people that I get to do this every day with. Um, this is the Knowledge knowledge portal development team again we're across oceans and borders um, it is really cool because it's a soft a joint software development effort it's not just here at the broad it's at the university of michigan and ebi and ucsd i have great people that i get to work with these are the people i get to see every day um, who are computational biologists engineers and various leaders of the the effort that i get to work with and i also like to thank the participants in the amp tg partnership for their guidance and funding and helping us think about these complex problems and making them better. And with that, I'll end and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Noelle, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion. portion. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your questions into the box that appears on your screen and click the send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question asks, what makes the type two diabetes knowledge portal different than other human genetics data results um, repositories? Hmm. Well, I think there's several reasons. I think one is that it allows it is specific for disease, so it's not just agnostic, whereas you can imagine um, NOMAD is agnostic to disease, and you know the, the 1,000 genomes and the other representations, the, it's, not, it's specific for a disease, so it's tailored to that. The other thing that I think is useful is that it brings individual level data that's been analyzed in a harmonious fashion um, by one organization. Um, with the best practices and tools garnered from that disease community. And it also brings to bear all the association statistics that normally you'd have to go to the various different sites. So instead of having to go to um, a GWAS repository here for this data set, and the here for this data set, and here for the, this data set, we actually do an active process of constantly aggregating, updating, refreshing that data, and bringing it together so that you have it in one place. I think the most useful tool, though, is its distillation and sort of the knowledge. So it represents for you sort of the best results you're supposed to look at that would be relevant to, you know, prioritization of variants or most causal or most um, associated. But then it also sort of, so it guides you towards the high level, but it also allows sort of a custom view where if you want to run your own analysis and you don't want to go to the individual level data, meaning like having to request access and go to some, you know, terminal and run R and represent the data, you can actually in a very nice UI, ask a question that runs interactively on the underlying um, GWAS or exome sequence data and represents the results to you. So you don't actually see any individual level data, so it protects all the data, but it gives you the results on the fly. So I then think that makes it different. It also makes it different in the sense that it's open access. Anyone can have access to it. And we're actively seeking collaboration. So it's not just about, you know, send your data to us. We want to collaborate with you. So we want to write papers off the things we find together. We want to work together. We want this to be incentive for you, hopefully. Great, thank you. We have time for one more question and this asks, what if I wanted to contribute data or tool? How might I do that and what are the incentives? That's a good question. I think um, the incentives were still, you know, I, I, I think it's a bit of, for the greater good, um, but I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, how might you do that? First of all, if you just want to do it off the site, there's a tab on the front that says collaborate with us. And this walks you through what it would mean to collaborate. Or you can just contact me. But the collaborate to me really means you're interested in bringing your results. You might have some samples for which you don't have an analysis run. You want someone to analyze the data. Um, we can do that. We will do that for you, with you, in partnership with you, and you get the results immediately to you back to you. Moreover, you get to see your results in concert with all the other types of IBs to next result. So for that, it's, it's summary statistics are easy. We make it super easy. Um, hopefully no work for you. We have a very simple way for which you can actually bring your summary level statistics to us. We will load them for you. We can actually make them publicly available upon publication. I think that's an incentive for many people because many many um, publications are requiring that you have that right now. It's a nice alternative to dbGaP in the sense that you really don't want to make your, all your investigators go get your data from the various sites and request access, and it takes a long period of time. If they just want the results, they'll immediately have these in the knowledge portal. 
So hopefully it's an incentive for people to share data because it makes it easier for them. It doesn't require heavy ethical um, restrictions because we, again, we don't share um, any individual level data, we only share results. So we hope there's an incentive because you know, you're know you part of sharing your data on the fly, but you also get access to all these data um, right away in concert with your own. So hopefully that would make it useful. I would like to once again thank Noelle Burt for her presentation. I would also like to thank LabRits for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 2018. You will receive an email from LabRits letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.